to the agenda? All right, well, great. So let's move on to staff updates then, and we're gonna start off with a COVID-19 and vaccination update, and Stacy Saunders is gonna help us with that. Thank you for being here. Thank you all. So you're aware I usually start with our indicators, and that's where we'll start today. So as of today, we have 15,585 confirmed COVID cases that have been identified in Buncombe County since um, the first case. 293 COVID deaths have occurred in our community. And currently we are seeing about 68 new cases per day on average enter our public health workflow. This is remaining stable for the third week. It's been fluctuating um, around 65 to about 68 or 69. Our new cases uh, per 100,000 per week as of today is 178. Our epi curve, um, just wanted to show this again to you all, that clearly there's that um, holiday surge that we're coming out of, and the epi curve is showing some stability over the last few weeks with new cases mirroring uh, pre-surge, but not quite as low as what we had experienced back in the summer. Um, and if you'll remember, um, around July and throughout the summer, we were seeing increased um, incidence of cases, and that felt like a, a heavy burden then. Um, but com comparatively, you can see that uh, quite small compared to what we just came through, um, and we haven't quite reached um, those summer levels yet. Our percent positivity is currently um, and remains 3.4. That has been stable for the last uh, couple of days. And regional hospitalizations, um, mind you, this is um, the 18 county region. Um, Dr. Hathaway is here with us today and can give you more information about our, um, our local hospital system. But regionally, the hospitalizations also continue to show a steady and consistent um, decline over the last several weeks. The last few days showing a bit of stabilization. And then um, this is our table of metrics. Um, the table hasn't changed um, significantly in the last week. There was a slight bump in new cases per 100,000 that um, actually might be indicative of that stabilization because um, it didn't increase very much. Um, but the percent positivity remains quite low um, and is below the 5%, which is desirable. The um, testing data here um, has returned back to pre-surge levels. It remains really high, but is um, re returning to pre-surge, which during the surge, that was as much as 10,000 tests per week. And now we're seeing that come back down anywhere um, in the mid 6,000s to 7,000s. And then our COVID deaths per 100,000 population per week did see a significant de decline. And again, I always tell you all that's based on a really small data set. Um, so that can swing uh, from one week to another. And then our percent inpatient hospital beds occupied by COVID-19 um, continues to go down. And our ICU uh, beds occupied by COVID-19 is also still favorable. So our trends are indicative of progress in reducing the spread of COVID-19, but in order to continue to see these trends stay or continue to um, decline, then we have to continue to do the three W's. Um, vaccine rollout while, you know, is continuing and um, we're working down that wait list and getting more people vaccinated, it's still not enough for us to stop doing all the things that matter. So it is important for folks to continue to wear their masks, wash their hands, stay six feet apart, and limit your interactions as much as possible. So please do your part to help us fight um, COVID-19. So as a reminder, North Carolina is currently vaccinating groups one and two, and um, as of February 24th, school and childcare staff became eligible as the first group of um, group three frontline essential workers. Uh, we are coming in right after the governor's briefing. Um, and so the announcement was made that um, beginning tomorrow, the additional frontline essential workers will be eligible beginning tomorrow. That was initially March 10th. 
uh, we will not be ready to open tomorrow. We had already scheduled updates and testing of our surge capacity with the anticipation of March 10th, and we're gonna be testing out that surge capacity because we know that group three was coming and the updates to the wait list, particularly how someone can get off the wait list. So we will be meeting as a team tomorrow to discuss the progress of those um, updates and that testing of the surge, and then determine when we can open. So this is just a summary um, as of yesterday. These don't, all of these numbers are as of yesterday. Our state had administered over 2.2 million um, total doses with 1.4 million being um, first doses in arms. Among all Buncombe County um, vaccine providers, over 56,000 doses, total doses have gone into arms and about 63% of those are first doses and then um, Buncombe County HHS and our partners at Emergency Services have administered um, over 32,000 total doses um, since beginning our efforts on December 22nd, and over 20,000 of those are first doses with almost 12,000 being second doses. And I did wanna share this um, as we talk about the equitable distribution um, of vaccine and we've been tracking our efforts specifically as um, health department. And what you see here is Buncombe County HHS um, specific. Of the total county population, um, that first area, of the total um, county population, 2,309,000, 2, about 91% of our total population is white or identifies as white. And that total population, that total white population that is 65 years and older is estimated to be about 50, almost 52,000. Of that group, so the, the percent um, white and over and 65 years and older that we have given a first dose to, we've reached about 20, almost 26% when we look at that based on the numbers that we've given out. And so of the total population here in Buncombe County, about 6% is uh, black or African American. Uh, which is um, about 15,000. When we looked at the age breakdown, uh, we estimated that roughly 2,260 individuals are African American and 65 years and older. And through our vaccine operations, we've reached about 22.2% of that um, that are African American and 65 years and older, so a little over 500 individuals. So a little over 13,000 in the white population, a little over 500 in the um, black and over 65 population, which is about 22% of what is estimated in that age ban. And uh, we did use the Office of State Budget and Management Demography estimates um, for this information. Unfortunately, that same group um, does not collate the ethnicity data in the same way that it does for the racial um, data. And so there isn't the same age banding for that group. But we do have the total population information, which is roughly 10%. And um, of the doses, first doses we've given out, it's been, uh, we've given out about 1.4% to those who identify as Latinx. And so um, given that the, you've heard me say this before, given that the Latinx population across the state in general skews a bit young, uh, we knew that there was gonna need to be a lot of intentionality. Um, and also with our African American population too, uh, with access and um, making sure that we're intentional in reaching an equitable distribution. And so, um, but that particularly the Latinx one does remind us um, that we continue to need, need to continue to be um, mindful and intentional and uh, be planning for that. So more to come on another slide about some of that. And our current baseline allocation is 2,340. Um, this is still two trays of Pfizer as our baseline. Um, it may seem like an increase, and I think I explained this earlier, that previously it was based on five doses per vial. Now it's standard to, um, do, to base it on six doses per vial, so that's why you see 2,340 now. Um, this was our baseline for last week. It's our baseline for this week. It will be our baseline for next week. And then uh, sometime next week, we'll start to see the three week projection going for the next three weeks. Um, in addition to the baseline, we did receive um, what North Carolina DHHS um, calls the equity bump. 
for the, for the same three weeks. The intent of these doses is to provide access in addition to your baseline to historically marginalized populations. And last week we partnered with Tridstone Missionary Baptist Church and uh, Western Carolina University and others um, to administer over 280 doses. And um, this week we are partnering with Haywood Street um, to vaccinate our homeless and other um, recipients of services there and expecting um, to administer roughly 150 doses at that event. And then um, for next week to be completely determined as we're still planning is to have some Latinx um, outreach with that equity bump as well and integrate that into our um, existing fixed operations at AB Tech. So more to come on that one. And then um, added, in addition to our baseline, we continue to accept transfers from local partners. Last week, we accepted about 300 doses from our partner at Mission Hospital. Um, this week, we're accepting um, a little over 500 doses from our partner, Mayhek, and um, possibly additional doses next week. And then all transferred doses are applied to our wait list. We did begin vaccinating the school staff using the set-aside. Um, that began last Saturday, February 27th. And as a reminder, that was one tray of our baseline that we designated for that group. Um, and we vaccinated a, about 500 last Saturday. And as, a, um, as an update, once the lists were submitted from our schools, um, we were expecting any the highest number we were expecting was around 7,000 to be on those lists. What we got back was about a little over 4,100, so it's about 67 percent uptake in that group. And given that, and given that we are going to be doing a thousand, um, a set aside of about a thousand doses a week, we think about four weeks we'll have that group completely completed. And then um, our partners at Mayhek are assisting with vaccinating the child care um, staff. We anticipated that group to be as much as 1,100. Um, and what we see right now is about 670 signed up, so about an uptake of about 60% with that group. Um, Stacy, can you go back for one second? Sure. <clears throat> so we're getting uh, 500 doses transferred from Mayhek to County Health this week. Is that expected to be like a one-time thing or? Most transfers are only seen as one, one moment in time um, and um, not to be counted on the following week, but all of those doses would be incorporated into our um, efforts to get our wait list down, our general population wait list, and so we'll be um, adding appointments to our schedule and getting folks in those. Okay, so I'm just trying to kind of add this up. So if our baseline's 2,300, and then we've got 300 equity, 300, no, and 500 from Mayhek, is, is it, um, what's, the, what's the total number Buncombe County is going to have for the coming week? So for this week, you'll have the 2640, about 20, you know, about 2600, 2640, um, that is our regular allocation, and then um, another 500, so a little over 3,000, um, pending any other transfers or other developments. Okay, thanks. And then, again, um, 1,000 of that set aside. I feel like I should ask, go ahead, Al. Along those lines, you know, if you get the 500 for next week and we give the first shot, but you aren't guaranteed the second shot? No, if you accept a transfer, the, the agreement is when you accept a transfer for those doses, the provider who, gave, who transferred those to you and you accepted them must give you the second dose. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks. And Stacey, I was going to ask just on the, the Mayhek front, is that 500 in, in addition to their own vaccination program that they're that's they're, right. They unexpected. Okay. I believe they unexpectedly got another. I um, got a, an allocation and um, have been partnering with us to transfer some of that over to um, our okay. our site. Okay. Stacy, I have a question about the wait list. I think when I looked at it yesterday, it was about fifty four thousand. Do you have any anecdotal information about when those calls are being made to schedule appointments? Any idea of how many folks have? gone elsewhere to another county to another state um i, I just wonder like when we look at fifty four thousand, is how how accurate is that thanks for that question so that's part of what we're working on too is looking through that wait, wait list for any duplicates i will tell you i don't have a concrete number for you i can tell you anecdotally as we do call folks um, they are saying oh thanks i got it somewhere else um, and we say thank you and we keep going 
Uh, we do get emails and calls from folks who want to come off the wait list, and you can call us um, at the 419-0095 or ready at buncombecounty.org and tell us that you want off the wait list. Um, we are looking through that to see if there are any duplicates. We do recognize that folks signed up several times, and uh, we <laughs> want to, you know, give them their highest number and then <laughs> clean that up a little bit. So that's in the process. Um, and so you will continue to see that higher cumulative number because we don't want that to change. Because if you, if we clean it up and say, all right, now we really only have about 30 some thousand left, but we change that number. If your number 54,000 and we change that number, you might, you might think that right. we've deleted you. So that number is going to stay while we still clean up. Um, we are, we are scheduling currently around the the 17,000s, and that was as of last week's update. And so that gets updated every Wednesday, so you'll see that number change. I suspect we'll be closer to the 20,000s um, at that point. And then um, to your question about when, when are people getting scheduled. So typically when we see our, our allocation come in and we can confirm it, we start scheduling folks for those appointments that we know we're going to have part of our, as, as part of our baseline. Now, when we accept a transfer and those types of things, when, when the transfer is, um, it doesn't even have to be complete. When we have initiated it and we've confirmed it, we can open up appointments uh, with the expectation that the transfer will uh, happen um, probably within 24 to 48 hours. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I did want to remind folks that we do have additional uh, vaccine providers in our community. Um, Hospitals and local health departments were the first brought on board, and um, since then, our community health centers, our FQHCs have been brought on board. We also have um, commercial pharmacies like Walgreens that are participating in the federal program, and we have um, eight, to my knowledge, in um, Buncombe County who initially received about 100 doses per week. It is my understanding that their federal allocation is going to increase. I do not know for sure how, for by, by how much. But we do have um, Walgreens operating in Buncombe County that have doses as well. We have heard from other folks that they are getting appointments through other providers, including Walgreens. And so this is great news for access. And if folks are interested in learning more about um, other vaccine providers, they can go to myspot.nc.gov um, and find, they can put in their zip code and find a list of providers in their area that are approved for vaccine and um, are giving out vaccine. And so with that, I think my next slide um, is about vaccine updates. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Hathaway now because I think your slides are after this. And Dr. Hathaway can speak to um, our recent vaccine developments in, um, with J&J &J or Janssen, Johnson & Johnson. And then um, we'll be followed by Fletch with the executive order updates. Thank you, Stacy. I appreciate the opportunity once again to be here. I want to preface my comments by um, extending my uh, sincere thanks to the county in general, especially uh, Ms. Pinder and uh, Stacy and her staff, Dr. Mullendore, when she was wearing two hats. You know, when I look back and think about the first press conference we did here, it was just about a year ago today, and we were, um, you know, we knew everybody's name who had COVID in our community. Um, it's amazing the things that have happened and have changed, and it's nothing that I think any of us would have uh, wished for or wanted to go through. Uh, but in life, we're often given things that we don't expect, and it's our job to uh, make lemonades out of the lemons. And I think we've done that, and one of the, uh, the full cups of lemonade that I've been able to uh, drink has been the shared partnership with the county and other health providers in the region. And uh, it's sad that it takes um, events like this at the human toll to bring us closer together. But I think um, my real sincere thanks to everybody who's participated in the partnership. And I think as you're seeing, as we talk about COVID, um, it, it just in our day-to-day -day conversations, the partnership is exemplified. And I know that as we come through the pandemic this next year and into 2022, that those new relationships will serve all of us in our community um, really quite well. So it's, it's a really sincere thanks to you all for all you've done. Uh, we do have a new vaccine that's um, on the way. It's the J&J uh, uh, &J vaccine. It is uh, different than the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines in two very important ways. Number one, 
is that it's a single injection, so you don't have to come back for a second shot. And number two is that the uh, storage requirements are a little less stringent in terms of deep, cold refrigeration, so it should be more um, easy for us to have it more widely available as supply comes. The supply will be limited. We're only going to get about four million doses um, uh, 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 shortly and 20 million by the end of uh, March throughout the country, and so it'll take a while for it to ramp up, but we are getting some. We're getting between 70 and 80,000 doses in North Carolina uh, this week. We, uh, Mission Health HCA, applied on behalf of the 18th County region. One of the collaborations that come, has come from this effort has been um, a, a vaccine consortium that includes um, all, most of the providers in the region who are administering vaccine on weekly calls to understand where the capacity lies and where the vaccine uh, stores lie, and we match those up with demand, trying to make sure that we get the vaccine out in an equitable uh, fashion, and that's how the Mayhek transfers to the county have occurred and our transfers to uh, the county and other places throughout the 18 county region. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know exactly, uh, we're just getting our shipment. We just heard for sure we'd get the shipment over the weekend, and we're planning on how to distribute those 7,000 doses of the uh, J&J &J throughout the region. Um, I got asked the other day whether this was a game changer, and I wish it were a game changer. 7,000 doses is a drop in the bucket compared to the you know million people in our 18 county region that we need to vaccinate. But it certainly is is more light. The light's getting a little bit brighter um, at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I want to um, uh, just have a few comments, maybe as an educational form, if I can take the opportunity. I won't take up too much of your time. Um, but to amplify some of the comments that um, Ms. Saunders made, uh, if you look at the, the United States, what struck me has been the heterogeneity with which COVID has affected our country. And what's really striking on this map, if you look at it closely, red is bad, green is good in terms of numbers of cases uh, in different areas. And, uh, and it has not been a disease which has affected us um, uniformly across the country. And, Perhaps most striking is, is the fact that just based on the colors alone, you can look at state um, uh, lines and figure out which states had which public policies and how they impacted people. And uh, that was very striking to me that, that it's not just a biological phenomenon, it's a sociologic phenomenon that's affected our country. And I blew up Western North Carolina um, uh, as part of this so that you can see that our little 18 county region in the center of that blow up is green. And um, that is in uh, large part due to two things. Number one is our relative geographic isolation, but it's also due to the proactivity that the county took in terms of the measures back uh, last year and the proactivity that you've maintained in terms of social distancing, insistence on mask wearing and the like. And so I offer my thanks to you for that. This is a real uh, graphic example of the benefit of, of us all working together uh, to protect our community. So thank you. These are the cases in the United States. This, it looks almost exactly like the epi curve that um, uh, Ms. Saunders showed about Buncombe County. And I pointed out to show that we are seeing a rapid decline in cases across the country. But look very, very closely at the bottom, at the far right end of this graph, and you'll see it's flattening out and rising just a little bit. And what you'll notice about all the other upward uh, slopes on the graph is that they're preceded by a downward slope and then another upward slope. And so I'm worried, very, very worried, I remain concerned that we're gonna see another rise in cases. And so I want to amplify, or, uh, amplify uh, uh, Ms. Saunders' comments that we need to be diligent to the three Ws. We're down, we're much better off than we used to be, but we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination. These are the cases at Mission Hospital, um, actually Mission Health System across all our hospitals in the region. It looks like the exact same shape of the curve. The blue line is total hospitalizations. The orange line is uh, patients in the ICU and the gray line is patients on ventilators. We peaked in January at Mission Hospital about 138 patients in the hospital. Uh, we're down to 30 today. So dramatic drop, we're very grateful for that. But at the same time, we've seen 299 deaths. And I, I, I bring that up to remind people of the seriousness of this disease. And it affects, while it affects older people disproportionately, it affects uh, um, young people too, and we had a death of a 19-year-old App State student um, earlier this year. The benefit of our vaccine program in terms of protecting the elderly is shown in this graph, and uh, just very briefly, 
Um, the orange curve is deaths among nursing home residents um, as a percentage compared to all deaths from COVID. And you can see that when we started the vaccine program in, uh, Jan at the end of December and January, and we targeted nursing home residents, the most vulnerable in our society, the, the percent of uh, all COVID deaths in that population dropped off dramatically. So I want to use this to encourage the populace, the people uh, watching this, to recognize that the vaccine is safe and effective and works. Just a few more slides before I finish up here. Um, Stacy did a very nice job of pointing out what a wonderful job the county has done in terms of targeting uh, minority populations. This is data from across the state, and I apologize for getting geeky with my data, but just indulge me for a moment, please. The, uh, the, the dark blue bar is the percent of the population that is of that uh, racial group. The orange bar is the percent of the total cases that had COVID. The dark gray bar is the percent who were hospitalized, and then the light gray bar is the percent who have gotten vaccinations. In a perfectly just world where the virus affected everyone equally and we got all that same kind of health care and we got vaccinations the same way, every bar would be equal. For African Americans, you'd be 21% of the population, 21% of the cases, 21% of the hospitalizations, and 21% of the vaccinations. That's not the way it is. Right now in North Carolina, it's 21% of the cases, 34% of the total hospitalizations, and only 15% of the vaccinations. The county's doing a better job at that, and I, I commend them for that, and uh, we're working hard to, to uh, vaccinate people who are uh, disadvantaged, but I, we have a ways to go, and I just wanted to use this forum to point that out. And then last but not least, there's been a lot of talk. Um, I mean, you can't, I gotta pander to the public here with a, a slide with dogs in it, if you don't mind. <laughs> Um, but uh, we, uh, lots of talk about why we're worried about an upward rise and the variant term has come up. And so I wanted to take just a brief second to let people uh, know exactly why we're worried about variants. Variants are uh, uh, SARS viruses that are very similar but slightly different than the original strain and they have a change in their genetic coding, that RNA. And the reason we're worried about it is because it can change the antigenicity the virulence and the transmissibility. Well, what does that mean? It means can we fight it off? Will we develop antibodies that will fight it off? Number two, will it make us sicker than the regular uh, virus does? And number three, how easily is it spread among all of us? And different variants um, uh, can lead to different effects that way, and that's what has us most concerned. The analogy that I, I picked here for a talk earlier this week was that if you think of dogs and viruses as being equivalent, and the sporting group in dogs being equivalent to the coronaviruses and Labrador retrievers being equivalent to the SARS-CoV-2 variants would be different colored Labrador retrievers. So they're very similar, they're slightly different, and that difference changes the way they behave and how we have to combat them. So that's why we're concerned. New variants are coming. Um, I think the vaccines will be effective against them. Data suggests that they are right now, and where they're not, we can tweak our vaccines moving, moving forward. Uh, thanks, and I appreciate the indulgence, and happy to take any questions if I can. I have I just one question, and um, Dr. Hathaway, you could field it, or Stacy, or whoever would like to. One of the one of the metrics that we track is the number of cases per 100,000 in our county, and while a lot of the numbers, you know, a lot of the metrics have really improved since early January. That's one that um, remains, you know, orange or you know, not in not in a green spot. And is but as part of that, is it correct to think about that? Is that we we are doing a lot more as a community and a country in terms of testing now than we were, say, six months ago or three months ago. And the amount of testing that's done does influence that. While testing is good, the more you test, the more you're going to find per 100,000. So, I just wanted to ask that question to kind of put in the context as we look at that particular metric. Um, how, what that all means together. Yeah, and I'll let uh, Stacy comment if she wants to in addition. I think that metric can't be looked at in isolation. It also has to be looked at the percent positivity. So it, for me, the percent positivity is a little bit more important because, you know, it takes into account how many people you're, you're, you're actually uh, testing. I don't know, Stacy, if you have additional comments. Totally on the right track, but um, yeah, the percent positivity. So the new cases per 100,000 per week 
really li literally does look at the seven days and how many new cases came in during that time, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we've seen that reduced by um, over almost 60% since the new year. So that, that's good news. The percent positivity has declined as well, yet our, our testing numbers are still quite high. So I, I liken it to if you, if you were doing 10,000 tests and your percent positivity is, uh, is 3%, you're, you're gonna still have a high number of folks coming in. And so even though our testing numbers have um, come down and are stabilizing pre-surge, even pre-surge, we were doing a lot of testing. So we've done a really good job as a, as a community saying we have, we have access, we have opportunity. If you have symptoms, if you think that you've been in contact with someone who has COVID, come get tested. Um, and what we're finding is, is still um, with our decreased percent positivity, we're still gonna have a high uh, level of, of new cases. Now, when we look at our new cases per day, which is where that epi curve kind of comes in too, because that's based on um, specimen collection date, and it's reported two ways. What, what I say, show you all is more traditional epi style, which is by specimen collection date, but it's also um, shown in the same way as um, when reported or when, um, when it comes in. And so when you look at that per day, that new ca ca cases per day, um, that's where we're seeing that 60, 66 to 68 new cases per day on average. Um, whereas back in the surge of the, what we thought was a surge in the summer, that was 40 something. And so we're still, I mean, that is coming down exponentially from what it was at the time of the holiday surge, um, but still at high levels, we still have community transmission. This is why it's really important um, that you, you have to look at all of this together because while our percent positivity continues to, to go down and it is under five, we still have transmission out there. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, uh, any other questions for Dr. Hathaway or Stacey? Fletch is gonna talk to us as well, but any other questions for now? I had two questions, I guess, for Stacy that you can answer answer now or, or later, I guess, but um, the first was around that demographic slide, which I thought was out, outstanding, uh, really helpful to give us a picture of how we're doing uh, on the demographics side of things. I was wondering in maybe a couple meetings from now if you could include the, um, in terms of age, folks that are 75 years of age and older or, or even 80, if that's possible with, with the data set you're using. We do, so we already have an age banded from okay. 65 to 74 and then 75 and okay. older. I don't have it past that. Gotcha. Um, I did combine it this time because it matches the group that we're in, but we right. actually do look at, it, look at it stratified and I can do that okay. for you. That'd be great because I'm just, I guess I'm just generally worried about the older, you know, the oldest mm -hmm. population and their their access and internet availability and that sort of thing. So sure. that, that would be great. And then I, I, I'm just curious from, from any of you around group three, you know, with group three opening up in the next week or so or, or, or whatever, it, it's getting a lot more complicated in terms of the categories and employers and, and that type of thing. And I just didn't know if you had any off the top of your head thoughts that you'd like the, the public to know around that that challenge on your end and, and expectations they should have for, for signing up and qualifying under their uh, employment status and that sort of thing. So I can't speak for all vaccine providers, but I can tell you for, for us in particular that um, one of the things that um, the state has done, and this is regardless where you live in the state, you can go, I had shown a slide of um, my spot in .nc.gov where you can find a vaccine provider. There is a, um, a separate one about uh, find my group um, that if you just Google uh, find my group, North Carolina, it will come up because I, I don't I hesitate saying the um, website and not getting it right, but we will get that out to folks and I'll be sure it's in the press release too. That you can go to that website, answer some simple questions about who you, like what age are you, what kind of work do you do, and it will tell you what group you're gonna be in. So that's the first thing that folks can do. Like if, you, if you're not sure, that's one of the easiest tools that's out there. So if you do find that you're in um, group three, um, frontline essential workers that are gonna be eligible beginning tomorrow, please know that we, are, we had things planned and we are working as quickly as we can to um, get that wait list to, to accommodate group three. Um, but what you can expect is when we open it, after we've tested the new upgrades and tested the surge, 
when we open it, you'll follow the same process. Um, you can call in or um, you can go to the online or the, the website and put yourself on the wait list. Um, you will, like I said, it's best to go ahead and uh, make sure that you're eligible for that group. It's a great practice just to go and see where do you, where do you fall because you might think that you are group five and you actually might work in one of the eight sectors. That's one of the criteria, and you might be in group three or you might feel the very opposite, which is you might feel like you're an essential frontline essential worker, but based on the state's first criteria, which is are you in person, like the number one is are you in person, and then are you in one of these eight sectors, and all of those eight sectors are listed on that site too. You might think that you're one of those and then find out you're actually in group four or five. So it's good to know. Um, so that's the first thing I would tell folks to do, but once we open it up, um, our wait list to that group, it'll be the same process of calling in or, or going online. Thank you. That, then it looks like findmygroup.nc.gov. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. I just want to give a quick update on our new baseline executive order, number 195 from Governor Cooper. It went into effect last Friday the 26th at 5 p.m. and scheduled to remain in effect until Friday, March 26th. Just going to hit some of the highlights of the uh, more immediate changes for us. It did remove the safer at home curfew, which was a 10 p.m. curfew for everyone not an essential business. It uh, allowed alcohol sales, um, on site alcohol sales, to remain in effect until 11. So now that curfew for alcohol sales is 11 to 7 a.m. Mass gather limits went back to where they previously were for 25 indoor and 50 outdoor. Um, one of the biggest changes is, is that bars now open. They, if you guys recall, they've been one of the few industries that have been remained closed its enti entirety of this response. Now, they're now allowed to open up to 30% capacity and not to exceed 250 people. And of note that their operations must be seated. And there is also, as always, the caveat that they must allow six feet between groups of patrons, and that's going to really be there. I think for a lot of bars in this area, they're a limiting factor. Not, not that percent capacity or the number, but allowing six feet between parties. Large indoor venues of more than 5,000 may operate at 15% capacity, and smaller arenas and stadiums may operate at 30% capacity. Uh, th those are the highlights. There are some smaller changes to language, but this, these are the things that significantly affect restrictions. All right, thank you, Fletcher. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else, anything else on the uh, COVID vaccination? I just wanted to promote for as we step in the phase phase three of our um, COVID vaccination priority groups, that anyone who's interested in receiving alerts of when that comes online or uh, information mm -hmm. and text BC alert to 99411. And they'll see those notifications coming from the 419 zero zero nine five number but that's a really good tool to stay informed of the vaccine operations bc alert to nine nine four one one so the only other question i have about the vaccine says um do we have do we have a way so in the one of the earlier slides that stacy showed it was the total number of vaccines that we believe have been administered by all vaccine uh, distributors or administrators in the county um Will, will we have a way to continue to track that going forward? So like, you know, Walgreens is getting supplies as others get it. Will we have a, a way of being a, uh, aware of how many they're receiving on a weekly or some time basis? So the numbers that you saw up there are based on the North Carolina DHHS dashboard that shows that for the, the county as a whole. And so that would include uh, vaccine providers that are um, receiving allocation and, and administering. Um, as far as um, we do get notification um, each week about new providers or new providers that are being enrolled. And so it'll be, um, it's sort of the list is set up in who's been um, accepted and enrolled and can receive the allocation versus folks who have um, started the process but may not be approved and may not be able to receive allocation yet. And so we can see as new providers come into our um, community it's not, um, there's not a great way to know exactly how much all of those folks are gonna be getting each week. 
if they're part of the North Carolina system, we can typically uh, find out because we're a part of the collaborative and consortium together and we, we talk to each other. Those enrolled in the federal program, a lot of our information comes from our state partners when we have updates um, and when, the, when they release information about those federal programs. So I don't always get the information, I don't get that specifically for every Walgreens. It's more of a general um, notification that we get from our partners at the state that says, in your community, there's gonna be this resource and in general, they're all gonna get this much. But the, the numbers you saw up there are gonna be consistent um, as the um, dashboard has that information. And over time, the state you know, may include more information on the dashboard than what it does right now. Okay, so, so yeah, not going down to the level like a single store, but do you think that, for example, we will, you, or you, you would be able to see how many like Walgreens in Buncombe County are receiving on a weekly basis, or is that still a little unclear? At this so point? typically what happens is the state will inform us when it's something like the federal program that Walgreens and CVS um, participates in, the state will say to local health departments, to other vaccine providers, this resource is, co is coming, this many stores will be participating, this many are in your community, and we anticipate that they'll get this much. But that is a federal vaccine program, so the state only knows that much. Um, and so if anything like that were to happen again, I would, I would anticipate the same precedent of we would be notified, we would know how many in the state, how many in our community, and roughly how many doses they were getting. Um, if providers are participating in the state program, which we are and our hospital partner and our community health centers and um, uh, other groups, then as the consortium and um, we typically, as part of our allocation, notification, we can see our other partners and how much they're getting from mm -hmm. week to week. Okay. Well, great. I mean, to the extent that it's feasible, of course, you know, we're all very curious about how that overall supply is working out, especially as it gets more diversified. So please keep us posted on that so we can have a sense for sort of how the overall process is happening as it's, you know, increasingly not just, you know, a, 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 a small number of you know, the county and other key people who've been involved in it uh, delivering all those. So thank you so much. Um, are there any other questions? For now. Thank all right. Very, very quick. Thank you all so much for the presentation. Just a request to staff, maybe at an upcoming briefing, if you could get an update on the emergency aid assistance and the status of the, um, the different types of. Mic is off. I'm muted. Yes. <laughs> um, the different types of aid and what's out available and how those processes are going. That would be great. Thank you. I will circle back and see where folks are on that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. Okay, great, thank you. All right, thank you again, Dr. Hathaway and Fletcher. Appreciate all your work, and everyone on your teams. All right, the next item on the agenda is a discussion about uh, following up on our budget retreat. I'm gonna focus on education issues, and Jennifer Barnett's gonna help us out with this item. Good afternoon, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, yes, as Chairman um, Newman had uh, just indicated, we are back before you today. Um, we've um, gathered some information in collaboration with Asheville City and Buncombe County Schools. And I will actually um, let Sam Riddle, our budget analyst who presented to you before at the budget retreat around the topic of education, come back to provide you some of that. And then at the end, I will wrap it up um, with a conversation around the proposal for funding around those projects that we've discussed before, such as playgrounds, um, supporting the cultural arts, those kinds of topics. So I will turn it over to Sam and then come back. All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, pleasure to be with you again. That's the PDF, Max. Do we have the PowerPoint? Thank you, Max. Thanks, Max. So uh, we'll dive right in. Uh, you may remember from the board retreat, we talked about roles and responsibilities with the state and with the county, how the state per statute is in charge of instructional expenses and cover those costs. That's called the state public school fund. 
and that those dollars are allocated by program or goal. Well, now the county is responsible for facilities requirements, but uh, per statute, it does not stop there. It goes on to establish the local current expense fund that when added to the state public school fund covers all the operations for that year and that unlike the state dollars, the county appropriation is not allocated by program or goal. Now the specific questions that you had were around locally paid staff, per pupil expenditures, and local supplemental pay. We'll talk about all of those and a quick aside about budget planning. And I think the best way to do that is to start with the local current expense fund. Now, uh, you'll notice in the handout, there are some definitions at the top. First three, local current expense fund being the first. And that is the non-state, non-federal, non-grant revenues. They're realized in this fund. And for the most part, we're talking about the county appropriation. A little bit comes in from the state in the forms of fines and forfeitures, but really it's local dollars up to local determination. However, for our purposes, looking at Buncombe County Schools and Asheville City Schools, this model applies only to Buncombe County Schools because Asheville City Schools includes the school supplemental tax. And you can see somewhat by the graphic there, it's about 54, 45, and one. It's a rough estimate, but a slight edge in terms of the total piece of the pie to the county appropriation. It's really important to think about that when you talk about the question in mind here, which is locally paid staff. We asked each of the districts to provide us with an FTE count that is covered by those funds. And at that point in time, which would have been January, they gave us these estimates. Buncombe County Schools covers about 708 FTEs, Asheville City Schools about 266. Now the temptation, of course, would be to take that percentage that we talked about and apply it and say, okay, well, that's 145 for the county appropriation and 121 for the tax, right? But it's not that simple because those dollars are mixed. And once they're mixed in the local current expense fund, that one for one exchange of a dollar coming in and a dollar going out is somewhat lost. So it's not to say that this specific thing is covered by the supplemental tax or by the county appropriation, but by the local current expense fund. Now, when we talk about local dollars, um, what we uh, often talk about is the per pupil amount, right? What's that per pupil allocation? Now, unlike uh, many counties, Buncombe County has more than one school system. Per statute, we have to ensure that each one receives the same allocation per pupil. And we do that, it's usually around October. But the main uh, focus for this, of course, is the per pupil part. How do we find that out? You may remember me talking about average daily membership before, or ADM, and there are lots of them. It happens every month, it happens again at the end of the year. There's also something called the best one of two ADM that the state uses for funding. All that to say, we receive information from the state that gives us that per pupil amount that's then verified by each school district, and then we reconcile funding to ensure each one receives the same amount per pupil. This is a table looking at the last three years, including the current, on that per pupil allocation. This is inclusive of charter students, charter school students in each district. Uh, you can see that the per pupil amount is increasing each year and that the uh, share of Buncombe County School students is growing just slightly over the three years. But the real emphasis here is that this is the county appropriation. And when we think about per pupil expenditures, <coughs> Well, that changes a little bit when we think about Asheville City Schools because they also have that supplemental tax that figures in. So if we look at per pupil expenditure rankings, we'll see a little bit of a difference. Now, this is coming right from DPI's statistical profile. Some tables provide the ADM that DPI uses to make their calculations. This is not one of them. Uh, based on its placement, we assume it's the final ADM. It certainly would make the most sense but it is not the same one that we use to reconcile. So there's a slight difference there. I can already tell on your faces, even with the masks. <laughs> that is confusing, I get it too. Um, so looking at local per pupil expenditure rankings, we're looking at the last three completed years, that is the years that we have final ADM counts for, as well as a total full year of expenditures. 
Buncombe County Schools is steady. That is, of the 116 school districts in the state, Buncombe County Schools has ranked 15th, 14th, and 14th over the last three years. Knowing that we have to ensure that each school district receives the same per pupil amount might lead you to believe that ACS or Asheville City Schools should be right in line there, right? But remember, supplemental tax. Asheville City Schools actually ranks second in the state in local per pupil expenditures. It's worth noting that the number one overall Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools also has a school supplemental tax. So the quick aside here, when we think about budget planning, you know, we, we often, we're, we're just looking at the data there by per pupil, but when we talk about budget planning, we're talking about total appropriations. It's usually just what's that full amount. And the way that we arrive at that is something called the unrestricted revenue growth rate. That's looking at all of the revenues that the county receives that are not limited by statute or by grant terms. And we say, hey, from the current to the upcoming year, how much do we expect those to grow? And if it were, we haven't done this calculation yet, but if it were 3%, then we might say, okay, that's 3% that Buncombe County as a whole is growing. So school districts, you can expect that level of growth. We want to share that growth with you. So expect 3% increase in your allocations. That allows them some information to begin their uh, budget discussions. That certainly helps us in our budget discussions. Some counties use a formula that is very specific input and output, right? We stick to the formula. I would say what we have is a standard because the schools can take that amount and say, hey, this will or will not help us meet our obligations this year. And if it does not, then it helps facilitate that dialogue. They can come back to you and say, we're going to need an additional X to help fulfill that need, and that dialogue can continue. So um, local supplemental pay is our last area. I want to stop here briefly to acknowledge those definitions again. We talked about the local current expense fund. That's the whole pot, non-state, non-federal. We talked about the supplemental tax. That's a property tax. Those revenues go directly to Asheville City Schools. And now we're talking about local supplemental pay. It's a pay component. It's actually quite separate from those other two items that we were talking about before. And it's very important because the state sets the salary schedules for all positions, basically. They want to ensure that if you're a teacher with two years on your license, that you would earn the same in Wake County as you would in Buncombe or Madison or Pascatank, right? Base amount. The way districts distinguish themselves from one another is through the local supplement. That is, it's entirely up to their discretion how they want to configure their local supplement. Uh, who gets it, by how much, or what method. And the last bullet point I wanted to mention on this one is 100%. That is, for Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools, effectively 100% of personnel, of employees, are receiving the local supplement. I say effectively because there are exceptions. For example, substitutes, which are by their nature are more temporary, would not receive it. But what you might consider regular or permanent employees would receive the local supplement. So I'm going to share a table with you. It's the average supplement for teachers for 1920. Again, just teachers, average supplement for 1920. Buncombe County Schools ranks fourth. Asheville City Schools ranks 13th, which is just below the state average. This information is also in the handout. Here's what I don't like about this table, though. It tells you nothing about the method that districts use to calculate their local supplement. Quick question. Yes. Say again, how many districts are there in the state? 116. There's 116. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So this table is the one that Buncombe County Schools uses to calculate local supplement. Uh, you'll notice it starts 8.5, goes to 16. There's also a non-licensed rate and the way to understand that is to say you know teaching versus non-teaching staff or certified is another word that you sometimes hear certified versus non-certified it's the difference between say a teacher and a bus driver or even a principal and a teacher assistant right but the thing to keep in mind there eight and a half to 16 and there's a rate for non-licensed Asheville City Schools uses this table which you'll notice has 
slightly fewer steps in it, but is in fact very comparable to Buncombe County School Stable. It starts at nine and goes to 16 and a half, and it's based on years of service. The way that they implement that is for licensed employees, it's years on license, and for non-licensed employees, it's years of service in the education system in the state of North Carolina. But these are not the only uh, methods for doing that. Yancey County, for example, uses a flat dollar amount by employee type, so it could be $300 dollars as a one-time payment for non-license and five hundred dollars as a one-time payment for license. Hickory City uses a flat percentage for licensed employees so each paycheck you get an additional eight percent let's say. And the top three that is the top three on that average supplement for teachers table Wake County Schools, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, and Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools they all use percent based on years on license and those percentages range from 16 to 24 percent, which is quite a difference from looking at Buncombe County National City Schools tables. Now that's a lot of information so I wanted to provide an example here. So let's compare Buncombe, Asheville City, and Wake County schools. If we have a teacher with one year on their license, they're going to earn $36,000 no matter where they are in the state. That's the base amount. The difference is that local supplement. So at Buncombe County, that's an additional 8.5%, Asheville City, 9%, Wake County, 17.4%. Quite an increase. But what about a more experienced teacher? Someone with 15 years of experience, it is on their license, they've got their national board certification, they're going to earn $56,000, no matter where they are in the state. At Buncombe County, that's an additional 11.5% for local supplement. Asheville City Schools 10%, Wake County Schools 16.6%. Now notice that Wake County Schools percentage number is actually dropping a little bit and that's because the table is not the same rate structure as Buncombe County and Asheville City use and in fact you were to, to graph it it looks sort of like a swoosh. That is it you know it comes down a little bit and then goes back up. Um, it's okay though that the percentage is dropping because your base is so much higher it's still a substantial amount. And the last example I want us to look at is a custodian. So it's a custodian one, let's say they're a 12 month employee rather than a 10 month employee. They've got five years of experience. What are they going to earn? Well, if the answer is it depends. Unlike those licensed positions where the state says this specific amount based on that year, they instead provide a range for those employees for those non-licensed positions. And so let's say it's, you know, 24 to 33. <clears throat> the point here is Regardless of the amount, Buncombe County Schools would provide 10.77%, Asheville City Schools 9.5% based on those five years of experience, Wake County Schools would not provide a local supplement. Now it very well could be that Wake County Schools uses the top of the range. I don't know if that's the case, um, but both Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools are using uh, their local supplemental tables to provide for those non-licensed positions. So if we focus back in on just that table piece from the slide before, I want to drive home uh, two points. The first, somewhat minor, if we know that the Buncombe County and Asheville City Schools tables are so similar, then knowing that one is fourth and the other is 13th, it's likely in 1920 that Buncombe County Schools had more teachers with more years on license, right? That's a logical uh, conclusion we can draw from that. The other more important one is of the 116 districts, the state average, which falls roughly between the 11th and 12th place districts, Asheville City Schools being 13th, something's pulling that state average up, right? And it's those top three. So there's kind of the top three, 16 to 24%, and then there's everybody else below that. So we've looked at a lot here local current expense fund and the supplemental school tax being a part of that. Uh, roughly 708 FTEs for Buncombe County, 226 for Asheville City Schools. We looked at that difference in timing on per pupil allocation versus expenditure and we talked some about local supplemental pay and the role that it plays for districts. So what questions do you have? You know, a question I have. <clears throat> 
have is when I look and see that Asheville City is second as far as, you know, per pupil, but 13th for the teachers. The question I've got is when you look at the biggest expense that any school system has is the teachers. And if you've got them out, I mean, to me the question is, where are they spending their money? You know, if it's not going to teachers. The, the only thing that I would add there is that the, the way the table is set up is it's a function of what teachers are there. So if the teachers were all really high uh, a high number of years on their license, then that local supplemental piece would be way up there. If it is lower, if they're earlier to middle, then that would lower it a little bit. So some of the ranking is a function of personnel and experience, too. Um, so I had a kind of a kind of related question. Going back to it's um, no, one of the like, I think it's the third slide. It's got the two bubbles. Um, the local current expense fund mm -hmm. one. Could you go back to that for just one second? Sure. If you can flip back again. I think it's the third slide. And um, that one. Yes, thanks. So um, the local expense fund for Buncombe County is, of course, basically the Buncombe County appropriation. Mm -hmm. And then the city, for the city district, it's the Buncombe County Appropriation plus the city supplemental school tax. Correct. So my first question is, is that pie chart for the city schools accurate in terms of the percentage that comes from, of their local funds that come from the county appropriation versus the supplemental tax? But, right. It is based on what I received. So it's about, like I was saying, it's about 54, 45 in terms okay. of making up the full pie. With that small remainder. So the supplemental tax is almost the same amount as the entire amount that the county appropriates per pupil for funding of that of school of the of the the, the students in that district. Which means they're almost yes. getting twice as much local funding as the county schools on a per student basis. Correct. Okay. I guess, the, I mean, just a kind of like, I guess it's really sort of the same question Commissioner Whitesides was asking, which is just, um, you know, is it possible, not in this meeting, but just kind of for future budget discussions to kind of get a better sense for, that's, you know, it's the second best funded school district in the state. It's almost twice as much funding as the county district does. So just sort of what the school district does with that additional Funding, you know, like what are what are the the teachers are funded at a similar level, you know, not a big difference. Mm -hmm. The county seems like it's a little bit a little bit better, but so what are what are the additional resources? What is the city school district able to provide with those additional resources that, like the county school district, generally or in other similar districts, would not be able to do? Is it smaller class sizes, a lot more other special? classes that wouldn't be typically able to be offered by a district, things like that. I think it's just always a question I think I've wanted to understand better. So as we go forward, it's a question I, you know, this is great analysis and I'd love to have more information on that yeah. question as well. There's one piece of an answer we can share and this comes out of discussions at the early childhood uh, committee level, which is that for, I've heard as much as 25 years, but I, I'm not 100% sure on that, the city has been using some of that supplemental tax funding the Asheville Preschool Program, which has grown to be one of the largest in our community. Um, so they're appropriating um, uh, at, at least, I think, 850000 annually to go towards a preschool program, which is sort of above and beyond what a school system would need to do and has resulted in a very strong, robust preschool program. So I can't speak to any of the other funding. Okay. Um, I did have a question that, and forgive me if it's in either of these documents, but are there any... Um, restrictions on what either of those two pots of either the supplemental tax funding or the county funding can be used for? Or can they just be commingled and used for whatever the needs of the system are? So they are commingled. That okay. is, they come together in that fund. Right. Um, the fund itself is sort of a mirror of the state funds. Right. So 
basically if a state account code exists, then the local code can also exist. The only difference really between the two is that local supplemental piece. The state won't have that code, but the local current expense fund would. Okay. So it's, it's basically if you can pay for it in the state, you can pay for it in the local. Thank you. It's my understanding too that at each of the, the various schools within the city's district that each of those schools do have some discretion in how they spend some of that particular money. So, you know, some schools it could potentially be instructional assistance. Another school it could be iPads for kids. It could vary. So I think it comes down to individual conversations with administration at those schools in terms of how they use that particular budget code is my understanding. I could be wrong on that. But it would also be interesting talking about this supplement to know per each of our school districts. I mean, just for information, um, back to your point of how many teachers and employees do we have at those various years of experience? Because I think if we knew that, then it really gets to the heart of that 4% versus 13%, um, just for information. Mm -hmm. We can keep that in mind. All right, uh, commissioners, other questions for now on, on this? Um, well, great, and so um, thank you very much. This is great. We really appreciate this. This is great follow-up analysis, and uh, yes, Jennifer, do you have more to share as well? Yes, so I'm gonna wrap up at the very end. Max, if we can have the end of this slide presentation brought back up, that would be great. And we'll continue um, to uh, gather information, and as we continue for budget development, we'll bring back as much information as we can and are able to gather. That's okay. So while I'm advancing through these, so our commitment, um, your request was for us to bring back to you a proposal um, around a process that enables the funding um, for the school related projects that have a, a really a community connection and aligns with or is included in the annual um, budget. And so just wanted to bring that back to you as I, sorry. It's okay, I think that was my fault for going all the way back. I'll keep moving through. Here we go. Um, so the categories that we had um, discussed with the schools uh, that are um, projects that may be brought forward that either don't fit a particular um, available funding stream or are items that individual schools may bring forward as requests that tend to fall to a lower priority in terms of um, each cycle for their capital planning process. And in those categories um, tended to be uh, the three that are outlined here. So playgrounds, we discussed this previously around um, new or replacement. Uh, obviously schools work to address any Im immediate safety uh, related needs for playgrounds. And then athletics beyond the scope of current allotments. So each school um, does have an identified allotment that is provided. I do believe that was for the middle and the high school levels. Um, and then the other category was really around the enhanced curricular activities. So activities that are relative to cultural arts, uh, band needs that are beyond the scope of those current, like whatever is allotted to each of those schools through their regular funding streams. And then needs related to career and technical um, student organization affiliations and or the clubs and activities. Um, so these are the requests um, that we um, would look um, to come forward. Um, from the schools, we discussed with the schools, um, each system, uh, Asheville City Schools and Buncombe County Schools, already has pretty robust capital planning processes. And so we discussed with them, um, you know, what would they be able to do to gather this kind of subset um, of information from, their, from the individual schools um, and to um, consider those in their planning process. Um, both schools were willing um, and able to do that. Uh, we would um, propose to them um, in their evaluation or assessment for those, um, you know, you all had indicated around a, um, you know, a, a community impact or it's, a, you know, it really brings up about a sense of community if this is a project that's funded. 
um, as well as would be in alignment with uh, the county's strategic plan. And so they were willing to do that, um, go through the regular process, and bring to budget staff uh, a recommended and prioritized list of these types of projects. Um, what we're hoping to do from that is gather that information and um, based on that list, um, I assume it will be long at the beginning, but perhaps be able for budget staff um, and the county manager to uh, recommend a, an annual amount, and I mean, may vary from year to year, but like this is what we wanna try for this year is to look at that list, make a recommendation to you all. I'm happy to provide you all with that list um, of what those projects are and, and maybe even the full list if, if you're interested in that. And then, um, you know, once that amount is approved in the adopted budget, uh, there are two considerations. I think one of the concerns that uh, you all had brought forward before was, well, you know, we're trying to do this on an annual basis, but what happens for those mid-year kind of off-cycle um, items? Our recommendation is, is that we identify an amount um, during the time of budget adoption that we um, hold back. So here is a, an allocation that we then distribute to the schools um, and we um, hold out you know, a dollar amount. And that if, that if projects come up throughout the year, then there is available funding. Uh, we are also would be requesting that if there are projects that are coming forward kind of mid-cycle, um, that the staff at each of those central offices are aware and has been vetted through them um, related to some of the considerations that you know there were there previously around regulations and um, and consistency so that's what we would recommend is that we come forward with you uh, to you with a recommendation um, based on that list um, we are recommending that the distribution be based on a final ADM you heard Sam talk about ADM and how many there are um, but available at that time, the best ADM would be for us to use is the prior calendar year ADM for a recommendation on distribution of the annual allocation amount. Um, and that uh, we also identify a dollar amount to withhold and that if no projects came forward for the fiscal year, those would, would fall back through to fund balance. Um, so that is our proposal and I'm happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> so Commissioner Jennifer is saying recommend, but this is what we will bring to you in the budget process, so you will see this again as part of the budget or conversations. Mm -hmm. So no ask of you to decide on anything today. It is really the response to you of how do we look at those, whether it was the barns or the playgrounds, or how do we bring those forward. We will bring those forward as part of the budget conversation to you. So is the, <clears throat> is the main thing that the, co the commission then needs to decide is like, you know, here's the, here's the number that from a budget planning standpoint, we think, you know, thinking about those needs, we'd like to have for planning purposes so that, you know, the diff I mean, this is not one of the big ticket items in the school systems, right? So, so I, I, but it could, you know, it can be helpful. But is that something that in, in the fairly near future we need to start, or at least through this budget cycle, we need to think about here's the amount that we uh, think should be appropriated for this. And, you know, unless things, you know, are shifted dramatically, that's probably kind of the, the number, I mean, that number plus inflation is sort of what the, we would work towards each year um, unless we change our minds. Is that? Well, first we wanna get that list. What are the projects out there that the schools is looking at that they haven't funded because it doesn't fit into one of their categories? Mm -hmm. So once we get that list and that number, then we can almost slate them into separate years and then you could see, yes, we wanna do playgrounds for all the intermediate schools or we wanted whatever those projects are and you would get that number at that time. And we could do that part of the budget conversation, yes, sir. And I will say that Asheville City, sorry, has already submitted. <clears throat> I went back to the question that you all had around what is the state and condition of playgrounds? And I think Dr. Baldwin answered kind of briefly during the budget retreat, um, but Asheville City Schools has been able to provide back to a list. So we have a current list um, and, and it does vary. I mean, there definitely are some Asheville City Schools playground needs. Um, some of them, you know, are fairly small. So I think less than 17,000 and then there was you know, a, a larger one that would need to be considered for an alternative funding source like that was considerably bigger. Um, so I, 
I would like to receive some information from Buncombe County Schools and then um, maybe take a look at that and um, even, you know, provide you all back with those comprehensive lists, but with come back to you with a recommendation. Okay. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, uh, I think we're ready to move on to strategic plans and Rafael Baptista is gonna help us out with this discussion. Good afternoon, commissioners. Hope you're all doing well. You we'll too. wait for the presentation to load here. You probably don't want me talking about uh, education, hey, Max. I'm sorry, before we leave, I just I had one other question about the schools that I meant to ask. Could I do that? Um, and here's my question. Um, we looked at the, you know, how's Buncombe County doing in terms of funding relative to you know statewide the statewide averages and the other districts and things like that, one of the other things that is I believe pretty unique, if not completely unique, about Buncombe County is the uh, sales the dedicated sales tax revenue that we have for capital planning. Right. So, um, whereas in most other counties, I, I think basically that's part of the budgeting process with the counties. You know, the schools are bringing forward. Here's all the different roofs and buildings that need to be built. And that's a big part of what counties are investing in, <clears throat> right? But we have this dedicated sales tax revenue. So my question is when, when we look at how Buncombe County's ranking compared to other counties relatively in terms of funding, are you counting the sales tax revenue that we're getting above and beyond the county's budget appropriations towards what the school districts get in totality? Or is all that sales tax revenue, which I think is about I don't know, $15 million a year, something like that, 12 Roughly. million a year, a big number. Is that over and above that? So the rankings that were um, provided to you by Sam today was specific to the comparisons for the local current expense fund, which would be outside of any capital consideration. So we could go back, I do believe the NCACC survey uh, potentially gathers that information that we could come back with a, a comparison on capital expenditures and I think they also do do a um, per, per pupil capital expenditure comparison, which we could bring back. I would love to ask you to do that so that we can kind of see that too. And again, maybe, maybe um, there's a lot of other things going on in other counties with additional revenue sources too, or Avril's saying there's not. So anyway, <laughs> um, I would like to understand that it is a significant revenue source. Mm -hmm. So as we have a follow-up on this, let's, let's kind of explore that a little bit more and how that adds to the total kind of local funding because even though it's not a decision we make it is part of the local funding revenue mix that the schools have so thank we you very much all right absolutely I'm, I'm, I'm done now sorry about that <laughs> all right so we're here to talk about the strategic plan um, so Really want to kind of talk to you a little bit, give you a primer and a reminder of the strategic plan that the board has adopted for the community, tell you about where we've been, what we're doing now, where we're going, then I then have some questions for you all in terms of getting some guidance on how you want us to engage with you throughout the strategic plan. So as a quick reminder, um, the Board of Com County Commissioners unanimously adopted a strategic plan that clearly established the vision and the values for the organization. Um, it sets four community focus areas of areas that we really want to focus our strategic efforts on for the next five years, and we want to make some meaningful progress. It includes 13 goals within those focus areas, so which are, really are the outcomes we want to achieve in each of those goals. So when we talk about an educating capable community, what do we want to achieve and give us some clear uh, finish lines there so we know what we're aiming for. It includes three foundational focus areas that set goals for how we do the work we do. So we do our work from a lens of equity. We make sure we have equitable impacts throughout the community. We do our work in a way of our operational excellence, and we make the best decisions around how we allocate our resources. But just to ground us in the strategic plan before we talk about it. So it's always important to remind where we've been before we talk about where we're going. Um, so we started this journey back in July of 2019 by really saying, what are the big focus areas that we need to prioritize in the community? Then from there, we went to the community, we asked them, what are we trying to achieve? What does success look like? And we did really meaningful engagement. We did 
13 public meetings throughout the entire community. We engage over 35 boards and commissions, and the community really told us what they were expecting and looking from, from us. We then went to our employees, and we said, what can we do? What's possible? How do we achieve what the community wants? And then from there, we developed the strategic plan that was unanimously adopted by the Board of County Commissioners. That was back in May. Now we then went to our department and said, okay, departments, you're the ones who are gonna be doing the work to achieve these goals. So how are you gonna do this? Develop a plan for how you're gonna do this. And everyone, all of our departments have developed and adopted and got an agreement from the county manager's office for business plans that dictate the work they're gonna do over the next three to five years to achieve our strategic plan. So we're aligning our strategy at a county level to our departmental work. So that's where we've been. Um, in terms of where we are now and the work that we're currently doing, We've developed focus area work groups. These are groups of subject matter experts from departments in each of these focus areas that work together to drive the work of these focus areas. So our subject matter experts are leading our strategy work. It's not performance management, it's not someone else, it's the subject matter experts, it's really important. We're developing focus area community indicators. So how do we measure success? If I wanna run a 5K in 30 minutes, I need to know what my mile time is while I'm running the race, but also before, as I'm training, I need to know three weeks out, where do I need to be in terms of my pace to know that I'll hit my goal and I need to adjust. We're doing the exact same thing with our strategic plan, developing those performance measures. We're defining our strategic plan values, so we know what our values are, but what do they look like in action? Um, Avril's been really adamant and strong in saying, how, what does, acting and living the value respect look like day to day? What are the behaviors? And then we're gonna drive those behaviors within the organization. So whenever you engage with Buncombe County, you can expect us to live up to our values. We're developing a public facing dashboard so there's accountability and transparency. The community can always look online once we're done with this and see what's our progress going? How are we doing at a strategic level and a departmental level? So we're doing this from a place of full transparency. We're aligning our budget to our strategic plan. One of the most important decisions a county makes every given year is how it allocates its dollars. So we need to make sure we're allocating our dollars to support our strategic outcomes that are in the strategic plan. So I wanted to talk a little bit about these focus area work groups because they are a critical foundational piece to the success of our strategic plan. There are really four goals, these work groups, right? The first is we're driving cross-department departmental collaboration synergy, getting departments to work together. A story I like to say is in a previous organization, we had, um, in the community, we had a lot of those hotels that are weekly rates, where you rent a room for 100 bucks for the week. A lot of folks who can't afford an apartment use those as top cap. The fire department was worried that there was a lot of life safety issues, and they developed an initiative to shut down those hotels. They were in a work group like this with the housing department said, hey, those hotels are actually an important part of our strategy for affordable housing. We're trying to increase the number of those hotels. But by being in the room together, they realized they were rowing against each other and came up with a solution that both increased affordable housing and increased life safety. And that's what these work groups do, is they bring departments together so we don't have silos. We are able to review and discuss our progress and see how we're doing and move the needle. But really it's, we're working together, rowing one direction to move the needle. That's the focus work groups. Um, you can see here the departments that belong to each of these work groups. So departments belong to multiple work groups. We've been creative in making sure all the relevant partners are in the room working together so we don't miss things um, when we're doing this work. So, Every initiative that a department has, every initiative in the strategic plan is gonna go through these work groups. But I wanted to highlight one initiative from each work group that I think is really interesting. Um, so the first one is our library department does really great work around supporting high childhood education through the preschool outreach program, helping preschools teach kids how to read. Normally the library does this on its own, but through our business plans and the work groups, EMS is providing them books to teach kids about calling 911 and CPR and things like that. Recreation Services is helping them think about how to use books to teach kids how to exercise and be active. So we're bringing together our different disciplines to support this work. 
we're trying to reduce the rate of children coming into foster care because of parental substance abuse disorder. So social services can't do this work alone because so much of the engagement with the parents over substance use disorder is through the sheriff's office, through public health, and through emergency services. So by them all working together, we can make meaningful impact on this one. We're looking to revise our economic development policy to, uh, to increase wages and see how can we get higher wages for our community. And we're trying to say, instead of just having a county strategy for reducing gas, greenhouse gas emissions, how can we work with each individual department to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions? So we're developing departmental strategies for this. So we have macro and micro actions to move the needle forward on this. So that's where we are. So what's coming down the pipeline? What's next? First is regular public reporting of strategic plan progress. We're anticipating that our public facing dashboard will go live in the summer of 2021. And we'll be updating it with updated data and performance indicators on a quarterly basis. And um, I'll be here joining you all on the quarterly basis to provide you an update at briefing meetings of this dashboard. So you'll have new data every quarter that you can look at and we'll have updates on how we're doing with our initiatives. Raphael, can you give us an example of what might be on that dashboard? That sounds really great. Next slide, actually. I'll have okay. a mock-up for you of what the oh, dashboard cool. looks like. Yep. <laughs> I'll just sit here. <laughs> um, we'll be presenting to you budgets that are aligned to the strategic plan. And I think that every year we'll get better and better at that. Um, that's one of the toughest parts of strategic planning, but we're committed to doing it well. We'll be aligning individual performance with the county strategic vision. So every employee is a vital part of moving the needle forward, and we're gonna be showing that line of sight so every employee is part of this work. We do this all as all one Buncombe County, all team members. And we're gonna be aligning racial equity with strategic plan efforts. If we achieve our strategic outcomes, we've only really achieved them if we've achieved them for all of Buncombe County, and we're committed to that. So aligning it to our racial equity action plan but also applying an equity lens to all our work to ensure we're doing this from a place of equity with equitable outcomes. And seeing more and more collaborations between departments for new project ideas. So this is what the dashboard, this is what a performance measure will look like in the dashboard. Um, the performance measure we created for this one was build and ma manage infrastructure drives a special strategic plan implementation. It's not a real measure. Um, examples of real measures are gonna be resident satisfaction with certain services. It's gonna be uh, percent of residents who live within, I think it's a quarter mile of a greenway or a county park. Um, it's gonna be the number of children um, put into foster care due to parental substance abuse disorders. Um, so those are some examples of them. But you'll see it's on that, that gauge is gonna show you either a red light or a yellow light or a green light of are we making progress towards our goal for this measure. So each measure has a goal, a target. So we're measuring progress. Are we on track? If we don't get our game together, we're not gonna make this. We need, might need some fine tuning or we're in a serious danger of not meeting our goal. So we need to make some significant changes or decisions around it. So that's the, the gauge. On the right, you'll see a line graph that shows actual performance versus target performance. Then what we're also doing is creating composite scores for each one of our 13 goals. We're saying all the performance measures that build up to that, how are we doing? And we're giving a score for that goal. So you don't have to look at any individual measure, but you can look at the goal and say composite wise, how are we doing with this goal? Um, and that'll be coming in the summer of 2021. So this coming summer. So, um, where we're here to ask for your feedback is the role that you all want to play. Ultimately, as much as this is the Buncombe County strategic plan, this is the board strategic plan. Um, it is you all that adopt it. Um, so we want to make sure that you all are engaged in providing us the direction that we need to implement um, your vision for Buncombe County. Um, so we have a couple of ideas. Um, be curious to see your reaction to our ideas and to hear anything else and any other feedback you have. So idea number one is kind of focus area subcommittees. So taking the existing affordable housing and education committees and piloting them where we would be able to take items from the strategic plan from those focus areas, send them to those committees to get feedback. 
before they come to a briefing or to the full commission. Um, this is kind of built upon what we've seen in some other communities. Um, so this would be a pilot way, so kind of a lower effort way to try out this and see if this subcommittee is something that the board is interested in. Um, the second option is we have these focus area work groups that have already been built and they exist. So if you all are interested in something around fiber and economy or resident well-being, you can kick it to that relevant work group. They'll work on it, they'll do the analysis, and then they'll come and brief you all and provide you with updates and some options. Um, then as I said, um, performance management will come in here quarterly, provide you with an update as well. Um, Avril, I'm not sure if you wanted to add anything on this, uh, on this slide. I think Nell, is, if you had any guidance that you want us to think through, or if you're interested in us moving mm -hmm. forward with any one of these, you can give us that feedback, and then we can develop from there and come back to you for, for more decisions. So for any uh, initial questions or comments? I guess I'm just trying to wrap my head around option two here is you would kind of set up work groups or teams in advance to, to handle is issues or ideas that come across our desks or minds. Yeah, I can, I can kind of give you an example. Yeah, so yeah. we have these teams already set up, right? So we have all the people work on economic development and affordable housing in a group already. So you're interested in exploring a concept around affordable housing, but you want to learn a little more. You're not quite in a position where you can make a decision or make a recommendation or bring something up for a motion. So you would refer it to that group. That group would do the research. That group would look at the implications and then come back to you with a presentation that you could react to. <clears throat> I mean, that's to me sounds like a model that would lead could lead to more efficient and perhaps quicker policy making. But but think more about it. So right now, the subcommittees of the commission we have, we have our <clears throat> early childhood education subcommittee. Um, we have our affordable housing subcommittee. These are both still relatively new in a way. We've had them, I guess, for a couple of years now. Um, my sense is that they've worked quite well, you know, really helped advance the uh, progress the county's been making in those two areas. Um, so, I mean, I think that's been a good, that's been a good model in a lot of ways. Um, of course, all these different committees require work, right? I mean, they require staff time. We probably can't, probably don't even see, you know, most of the work that goes into preparing for all of those meetings. So, you know, I think doing some more um, of those kinds of working groups, whether we call it a subcommittee or a working group, you know, maybe they're not all exactly the same, um, um, is something worth considering. But I also think we should be careful because I know all of our time is limited. You can only serve on so many of these, we also have all our boards and commission kind of related work that we all serve on. So, um, so I'm, I mean, I think this is interesting, but I, I, I don't know, you know, if we need to have one of those subcommittees or working groups for every different, I mean, I, the question will be, what are the areas that we really feel like it's needed, where it can really add value instead of just, you know, adding more meetings to all of our staff and commissioners who, who already go to, go to lots of meetings. I think that's kind of the, that's the main question that comes to my mind um, when thinking about that um, that question. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned this to some commissioners. I don't think I've had a chance to talk to everyone about it, but you know, one of the areas that I'm, you know, probably no surprise to anyone, like I'm very interested in would be some kind of working group around um, the clean energy work. Um, one of the reasons I feel like that could be an area that could benefit from it is that it's one of those areas you know, some things the county does, we've been doing a long time, mm -hmm. we're quite good at it. Maybe they need more money or maybe they need some, you know, different attention areas. But in some ways it's, we're, we're, we're already performing at a very high level on it. I feel like the renewable energy work, while I'm very proud of the progress we're making, it's kind of a newer issue. I mean, it's not, it's not something the county has traditionally, you know, been involved in for decades and decades. So for that reason, it seems like an area where uh, kind of, um, it needs some time and attention outside of what we're ever going to be able to give it at our regular meetings where we have a packed agenda for all seven of us. So, so I'm kind of an advocate for some, some sort of working group to um, kind of further explore that, that set of goals that we have 
I think coordination with the city of Asheville and probably other partners too is very important. So perhaps some kind of platform that would allow maybe even kind of a little bit of an intergovernmental uh, communication. Those are ideas I've been interested in. So I just, you know, sort of shared that. But um, what are other commissioners? Well, let me ask. Thoughts around this. Okay. Yeah. Now we already have working groups, right? Yes, sir, at the staff uh, level. And are you talking about using our existing working groups? So there's more. two separate items. That yeah, there's two options, right? So option okay. one is using the existing staff work groups and right. sending items there. The other option is to pilot through the affordable housing and education groups, having commissioner work groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I can weigh in a little bit. The first one, the commissioner work groups, we have two now, Brownies to Brownies Point, right. the affordable housing group and the early childhood group. We have three commissioners on each. The idea would be to take... Let's, let's pick on the education group right now with the three commissioners on that group. There's a lot of projects that we're working on that would impact that group that could go to that group, not start another group, but come to that group with our ideas, work through it, and get guidance from that group before it comes to the full board. So that's the first option. The affordable housing group, similar to that, they already meet, they already have an agenda. There are items that staff is working on that can take it to that, uh, to that group. We would like to broaden that idea, though, not just t talk about affordable housing, but affordable housing also sits within a vibrant economy group. So items that are in the vibrant economy group, we would rename that group and take it to that group to look at. Same thing with education. Instead of just pre-K, it would be education as a whole. The other option was the staff work groups. Right now, the staff is meeting quarterly, I believe, and we go through projects, making sure it's across departmental work. We would, t we would like to get input from the commissioners if there's ideas you're working on things that come across your desk, you can then send it to committee, let's say. It went to committee, and that committee would then study it, do the analysis, and bring you back recommendations that you can then implement and make a policy decision on. So those are the two separate ideas that staff came up with. But to Brownie's point, if there's a third group that you wanna add around the, the, I think it's, we call it environment and energy right now. If that's a third group that we need to start, let's think about that, how would that work? what time commitment, and we can actually have a, sec a third group, but that will be a commissioner work group versus a staff-led and staff working group. Okay. Where would the systemic racism fit in? When we look at the, you know, we talk about the jail, the health and human services, where would that fit in within this model? So every project right now that we're working on, every we're working through on an equity lens. We have an equity impact analysis that we do on all of our projects. So that's kind of consistent and baseline across everything we do. There's not a separate work group that is just working on equity. We do have an equity work group and all their work is folding into any project ideas that we're working on in every single work group. So I have a follow-up question as well. So with the, with the focus area subcommittees, so you're, you're talking about broadening like the education. So it's not just pre-K, same thing with affordable housing. Right. So with this, potentially this new group, Brownie, that you're talking about, then what, were you just talking about doing renewable energy with that or are you talking about that being broadened as well as the education and affordable housing? Right, so I'm, you know, I'm, <clears throat> um, I'm open to that, you know, the, again, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, I think the renewable policy work particularly needs something because it is such a kind of a new area of county work, not a, something that's long established and kind of in a, in, a, in a clear groove. But, you know, I'm certainly open to that. If we did establish some working group, it could be very tightly focused on renewable energy or it could be broader to relate to energy and other environmental or, you know, I'm, 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 I guess I'm open to that, um, that question for myself. And I guess I also wonder, for those of you that are already on the education group and affordable housing, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Because it seems to me, whichever way we go, we need to be consistent. So if we do these focus groups and we broaden them, then all of them should be brought into those different focus areas. Or if we're not, then there should be consistency in that way, it seems like, whichever decision's made. 
Does that make sense? Thanks. Can you say one more time? So let, let's use the Early Child Education Committee. Are you proposing that that committee, which has three commissioners and 12 community members, broaden its purview to be educated, capable community? Yes. Okay. And so the 12 community members really is about the allocation of the funding part. Uh -huh. and that's what they do. So my recommendation would be the three commissioners on that group would be broadened. And staff can bring ideas to them. And I'll talk about one that we've been talking about is after school program yeah. for our older kids. So is there a way that we can research that idea, bring it to this three commission subcommittee group, okay. get input on what does that look like? How do we implement that? How do we move that forward? So I, th I think I hear you saying something a little different than I initially thought. So you're not saying that the Early Child Education Committee would become the Educated Capable Community Committee kid. But the three commissioners who sit on that would sort of okay. be an interface uh, yes. for policy issues that relate yeah. to educated, capable communities. Correct. That makes a lot of sense yeah. to me, and personally. And um, and I also am so glad you all are bringing this up now, because certainly just speaking to early child education for a second, that committee's group, which is now doing this um, sort of working group around pre-K expansion, is, is very much dovetailed with some strategic plan goals. Um, and staff is doing a great job weaving all that together, but it would be exciting to have maybe some more formal structures as we think about all the ways those work that that work will dovetail moving forward. So that what you just said, which I hadn't quite conceptualized on the first pass, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, thanks for breaking it down a little more. Thank you. And then to Terry's point, we if we started one on the energy, I agree. Energy is so new that we're kind of trying to get into that market and do work. We're doing good work, but if we can have that focus on that, mm -hmm. you're right. If we can align that with a strategic plan, which would be energy and environment, and we, I know there was some interest on water quality, air quality, if we could yeah. marry those together and have that, um, but have a focus on energy as we do that, that would be a good. And then Al, um, I just got a text reminding me that racial equity would fit in our resident well-being as well. We don't have a group for that. We weren't advocating that we start a new group. We were really thinking if we can take the two that we currently have and broaden those, pilot that and see how it works, then come back and talk about the other two groups. So if we're putting one on the table for Brownie as three work groups, could we just go ahead and do all four or just do three and see how that works? Or the alternative was send any ideas to the committee, the staff group groups, mm -hmm. and we'll come back to you with ideas. So. Right. And on the um, affordable housing committee um, that we have in place today, it is a pretty tightly focused, you know, group. Um, our main role, we had a meeting earlier today, you know, it's kind of around allocation. It's kind of like the pre-K group. I mean, there's a pool of funding. Mm -hmm. We make recommendations to the board around the uh, investment of those funds. Um, but I'm sure we'll get into some policy stuff and things like that down the road too, but that's kind of been what we've mostly been doing. So Avril, if, um, if we were gonna broaden that group out to take on more than just what it's working on today, what are your thoughts about what other types of issues might uh, that committee work on? And we have a list, but off the top of my head, transportation needs some guidance. So one, yeah. that group would become a vibrant economy. So it would also go around to jobs, apprenticeship programs, affordable housing, transportation, things that would impact the economy. Right. It would be where we would look to land in that work group. Okay. We do, so we just wanted to do a time check here. We've got about 10 minutes left. We do have one other item on the agenda, which I'd like to move on to. So commissioners, do we, um, want to just kind of process this information for a while, think about this. We're, we don't need to make a decision today, but um, I think if we're going to move on to the next agenda item, we probably need to, to, to keep keep moving. So just let's let's think about this, and we'll, we'll, we'll schedule a follow-up discussion on these questions. Thank you. All right. Hey, thank you very much. Great. Appreciate it. Thanks. Right. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, so we're, we're 10 till the hour. Um, Okay, all right, great. So the, the next item on the agenda is a discussion of the proposed non-discrimination ordinance, and I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Beach Ferrara to get us started. Yeah, thank you so much, and Commissioner Sloan has been very involved in leadership on this, so we'll tag team in sort of, a, I think, a short introduction and an initial discussion. Um, and um, just for 
commissioners, I've had the chance to um, reach out to everyone about this in the last couple months as it's been under development and you should have received yesterday um, an email from uh, County Attorney Fru that included um, the most recent draft of what a non-discrimination ordinance uh, uh, that we're discussing would look like. So just wanna reference that um, as, as a draft that's available. But I wanted to just share sort of a few overview comments and then turn things over to Commissioner Sloan as well. Um, first of all, what uh, we will be moving forward with is introducing a non-discrimination ordinance for Buncombe County. Um, this would be the first time the county has had such an ordinance. And it's something that um, as I listen to community members, particularly community members who are parts of, or, of groups that have experienced discrimination, that there's a strong desire for us as a local community to make really clear what our values are around equity and inclusion and being a welcoming place for all people. Um, so specifically, the non-discrimination ordinance that we've been discussing for the past few months is one that would provide protections in the areas of employment and also public accommodations, which basically means the public spaces we spend time in, uh, a restaurant, a hotel lobby, a homeless shelter, that kind of environment. And it would provide um, protections for folks around uh, parts of identity, including um, uh, sex, dual orientation, gender identity or expression, veteran status, pregnancy status, religious belief or non-belief. And basically would translate a lot of what we are doing day in and day out at the county, especially around our equity work, into um, an ordinance that would ensure that people could fully participate in the life of our community, whether they're Buncombe County residents or visitors to Buncombe County, without experiencing discrimination or the fear of it, or should it happen, having some recourse, which currently doesn't exist. Um, one question that comes up a lot is, well, why now? And there's a very good answer to that, which is that on December 1st, 2020, um, and a section of a bill, a state bill called HB 142 expired. And that section had said that local communities could not pass non-discrimination ordinances. That section expired um, and now as a result, local communities can pass non-discrimination ordinances. And since that time, we've seen ordinances pass in six communities across the state, um, Orange County and a number of uh, both smaller towns and larger cities. And there also are between 10 and 15 communities, both towns, cities, and counties across the state that are currently at various stages of discussing measures like this. They, of course, will look a little different in each community based on the values of that community, based on local charter issues, and especially in the cases of cities. Um, so what I wanna do just briefly before turning things over <clears throat> to Parker is just talk a little bit more in detail about what we've been discussing Again, it would be an NDO, non-discrimination ordinance that include protections around employment and public accommodations. Um, and it would be one that really focused on education and um, rather than sort of the punishment side of this. But there would be an enforcement element of it and that would be civil, not criminal. Um, one piece that's been an interesting part of the research and development phase of that is figuring out what does it mean to build out a civil enforcement mechanism um, because we don't currently have one, although we do have ways to do civil enforcement around other ordinances. Um, and so there's a lot of models to look at. There's also 300 communities across the country that have passed NDOs in the last several decades. So the good news is we have lots and lots of models and growing numbers of models within North Carolina. Um, the final thing I'll say uh, briefly is just that, um, you know, sometimes issues come before us that are very personal, and this is one that's obviously very personal for me as part of the LGBTQ community. And th what motivates me more than anything around this is knowing we have a chance to help um, <coughs> create a community where LGBTQ kids who grew up in Buncombe County are hearing a message that they're equal, that they're valued, and that they have every single chance in the world to pursue their dreams and that they belong in our community. That may not be a message they're getting at home, or at school and other parts of their lives, but I think it's a message we can make sure they're getting as they um, grow up in Buncombe County. So with that, I'll turn things over to Parker. Thanks, Commissioner Beach Ferrara. Yeah, the only thing I wanted to add was, was read a little bit of, of why I find this uh, important and urgent and something that, that I push for and something that I think we should act on, and that's that LGBTQ persons in North Carolina still lack explicit, consistent protections at the local, state, and federal level. level and that's a big problem. 
A recent study from the Center for American Progress in the University of Chicago found that one in three LGBTQ people have experienced discrimination in just the last uh, 12 months. And that for uh, transgendered people, that number is higher at three in five. Throughout this health crisis with COVID-19, 15% um, of LGBTQ Americans report postponing or avoiding medical treatment due to discrimination, including nearly three in 10 transgendered individuals. And so I, you know, I wanted to push for this because I want our county to be a place where no one has to worry about being turned away or denied service, uh, for us to be an example to the community um, and to always remind our community and ourselves that we can provide these protections and, and offer these you know, civil penalties uh, to people without taking anything from anyone else, without taking rights or any, or any other uh, thing from anyone else. And so that's all I wanted to say. I think from a process perspective, our hope was really just to introduce the topic today, obviously accompanying the, the draft version everyone has gotten, and really that this is a dialogue moving forward among us, but also at the community level, having some great conversations with leaders in the business community, the nonprofit community, um, civil rights organizations in the community. Um, and, and the timeline would be that we would formally introduce this at our next meeting for discussion purposes, but not a vote. And that this would actually go to a vote at our first meeting in April, which is April 6th. So with that, it would be great. I know we don't have too much time left, but if there's any initial comments or discussions, and I just want to reiterate that I'm available to talk with anyone, answer questions, and what we want to do is create an ordinance that um, as many people as possible can come together around. All right, thank you, uh, Jasmine and Parker. Um, commissioners, are there any initial questions that folks have this evening? As Jasmine just pointed out, we'll talk about this at a our next meeting, again, for not for a vote, but for informational purposes. But are there any initial questions? All right, well, that's great. Y'all were very efficient, and we have a couple minutes before our next meeting is supposed to start. So let's adjourn this meeting um, and take a short break. Let's try to be back, though, by five after five to start the regular meeting. <laughs>